I just held a big grudge on darts itself and I shouldn't have friends and family. If it wasn't for them, I probably wouldn't be playing darts today. So I can now say I beat a two-time world champion. You are living the dream right now, I suppose. The dream, yes. But it's Baggish who's on the verge of bagging the biggest prize in North American darts. Danny, thanks for joining us. Thanks been, for having me. You've been on a, quite a journey to get to this point. Tell us, we'll go back to the start, first of all. Where did it start for you in darts? Uh, back, back all the way in the beginning, huh? It's uh, when I was about 11, 12 years old. Uh, instead of going outside and playing with my friends in basketball and football, I'd do my homework, put it up, and play in the living room with my father. And we'd do that for hours. So your dad was quite a player as well? Yeah, yeah, he was, he was really good at the time. And uh, he said, uh, once you get better than me, then I'm going to stop playing. When was that? <laughs> when I was 13. <laughs> you started beating him? Yeah, I, I, I took on really quick. I was always good at basketball, anything with hand-eye coordination. So I, I took on quick. And at which point did you start taking it more seriously, started entering competitions? Uh, when I was 15. Uh, it was a lot, of, a lot of soft tip back in the States, and, and steel tip was maybe just as big, but uh, all the tournaments around were soft tip. So my first big competition was uh, in Panama City Beach when I was 15. How did you get on in that one? I won the singles. It's easy when you don't know anyone, and you're just going up there at 15 years old, just throwing darts and having fun. So. Uh, obviously, it got a lot tougher as the, the years went on. So as a 15-year-old kid, was everyone there sort of like, wow, look at this guy, he's going to be a talent? Yeah, they, they kind of knew because I would travel around with my dad. Um, so they knew, knew where I was going, they, they knew how good I was at the time, and no one took me lightly, and um, they just knew that, you know, as a 15-year-old kid, anyone in any sport, you know, they're kind of a little cocky or whatever the case may be, and you have to grow out of that. So. Um, yeah, it was, uh, they, they just uh, loved me being there, basically. And as the years went on, did you become sort of one of the dominant forces in the American circuit? I, I felt like I was. I always felt like I was. Um, my dad passed away in 2009, so up until that point, I was um, always not necessarily scared of anyone, uh, but walking in thinking that I could win any event. Yeah. And after your dad sadly passed away, I how did that impact your, your life and your life in darts? Yeah, I quit for two years. Um, I, I held it close to my heart because he was the one that got me into it. So um, he passed away and, and I kind of was like, it's my fault, all that good stuff. But um, yeah, I, I, I just held a big grudge on darts itself and I, I shouldn't have. And how did you, how did you get <clears> back <throat> into the game? After? Friends, friends and family. If it wasn't for them, I probably wouldn't be playing darts today. So. Um, they got me back into it. They said, get, get your butt off the couch, come on, let's play. And uh, I grew love for the game again. So do you feel now like you're, you're playing for your dad and in his memory? Always, he got you into always, yeah. Um, my dad, my mom passed away last year. Uh, it's, yeah, it's been, it's been <laughs> I've been hit with a lot, a lot of people don't know. Um, yeah, just, just everyone really, um, especially my mom and dad. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear about your mom Thank you. passing. But again, that's another extra motivation, I suppose, when these things get hit at you, it makes you keep going, strive to, to be better. 100%, yeah. I, um, if, if it wasn't for me thinking um, that I was doing it for my dad and my mom, and um, I use that as my motivation. You know, everyone can find their own motivation, but I use that as mine, and uh, it, it helps out big time. You've, you've become popular here, I think, because people enjoy seeing the way you play the game with your heart on your sleeve. Is that because of what we just talked about there, the emotional side of the game that comes out when you play? Yeah, you know, I've always, I've always been like that. I, I've always held, uh, no matter what sport I played, I, I've always been emotional about it. If I love it enough, then I'm gonna show my emotions. And so uh, I'm glad the, the fans take to a, a genuine, real emotion and, and in me, and um, I'm loving it. That must make you happy to see that people are endeared towards you and they see they enjoy watching you because they, they sort of see themselves in you when you're playing with the passion. Yeah, it's almost like I'm, I'm living a dream and, and I'm, I'm, they're playing it through me as well, you know, and I love it. I wouldn't change it for the world, whether I win or lose or whatever the case may be. A, a, a lot of people, whether they're fans or dart players, wish they could be in my, my position. So I'm doing it for myself, my family, and everyone out there that is dreaming just like I am. When you won the 2019 North American Championship, that was sort of a, the big breakthrough in the world scene, rather than just the American scene. How, how, uh, how significant was that in your career and how did it feel to win that tournament? I didn't realize how significant it was until 
uh, the after effects of going to the World Championships, beating Andy Bolton in my first appearance, and and giving Nathan a run. Um, after that, things blew up, and, and I didn't realize how big they would blow up until it happened. So uh, at the time, it was just a, a tournament, and, and I'm living a dream at Alexandra Palace. But after that, it, it, it's now an eye-opener of, hey, this could be a career. Yeah. Your first Ali Pali, I think I remember seeing some videos of you interacting with the fans <laughs> and stuff like that. That was when the, the snowball really started rolling in this country about Danny Bagish. Yeah, there was a great story behind that. Um, I was... Uh, I was interacting with them and they were playing the song uh, Pump It Up and they changed the words to Bag It Up and it just clicked. So um, a lot of people don't know this. You guys are going to get an inside uh, kind of advice and intel on my walk on song, but uh, Glenn has passed that on to me. So uh, <laughs> exclusive. He, uh, <laughs> it's not official un until uh, I talk to him. I'll probably talk to him this week and, and figure it out. Wow. Well, that would be great. But you want to hear that walk on? You want to hear it played at. Uh place like Winter Gardens, back at Ali Pali, that must be your, your aim now to get back on those big TV stages. Really <sighs> Anywhere. I just, I just love the stage because um, you're interacting with the fans, uh, they're chanting, they're loving it, whether they're there for the darts or uh, just to have a good time. Um, I, just, I just can't wait to uh, get back to normal. 2020 was a difficult year for everyone. Um, obviously difficult because we didn't have much darts played here or around the world. But you still you played at Ali Pali. How did you keep yourself ticking over last year to be ready for to come back to Ali Pali? It's the World Championships. Whether you have fans or not, it's the World Championships. I think the issue with um, a lot of players saying you know it's it, they don't feel it's the same because there's no fans or whatever the case may be. To me, it's still the World Championships. So I, I prepared the same, um, more practice, uh, more dedication, and more time into the game to know that I'm, I'm going to play for the World Championship again. But to win two games, considering you had no, you know, in-person uh, practice matches throughout the year, that that was quite an achievement. Yeah, it, it's tough. It's tough because even back at home, uh, I would I would practice uh, twenty thirty minutes um, a day, and that was still enough practice with my with my youngest son being two. He would always come in and, and want to play, and then I'd stop practicing. But not not having the in-face competition and, and those things, it's it's just so tough. That's when the mental game comes into play. You, you just have to be mentally prepared for it. And first game, you came up against Damon Hatter. To beat a caliber of Damon, who's really um, made a mark on the scene in 2020, that was a big win for you. <laughs> there was two people in the draw I didn't want to draw. I'm not saying I couldn't win, but that was Ryan Searle and Damon Hatter. They, they were coming in, even though their ranking didn't show it at the time, they were coming in as a informed top 10 player, probably, especially Damon. So... I kind of got the bracket I wanted, no disrespect to anyone. Um, I got the bracket I wanted and uh, I said if I got past Damon, who knows what could happen. And then next up, two-time champion of the world, Adrian Lewis. <laughs> First of all, when you found out you are going to be playing him, how did you feel? Well, of course I got the news the night, uh, the night before or, or early in the morning about my brother having a severe stroke and uh, the surgery, so that kind of changed my mood a little bit, but talking to to Devin and, and getting the advice and inspiration again. Uh, it, it's, he's a two-time world champion. At any point in time, he can turn up. And, and we know that no matter what form he was coming in. So I had to prepare for that. And in the practice room, every time I looked over, it seemed like he was hitting a 180. So I'm thinking to myself, man, is this the Adrian Lewis I'm gonna get tonight? Which would have been great to watch, you know? Um, but I, a couple breaks went my way. Uh, two big checkouts, the 170 and the 91. Um, and uh, I, I can now say I beat a two-time world champion. Some players coming up against someone like Adrian with such a big reputation, they might feel a bit phased by that. Is that that's not in your character, I suppose? No, no. It doesn't matter who you play. You can't control what they do. You can only you can only play yourself in the board and try to get down faster and hit the double at the right time. Um, doesn't matter who I play. I don't care who I play. You, you mentioned there about the the tough news you got before that match. Uh, was it De Devin Peterson who gave you the, the words of advice? Has he been uh, someone you've you've been close to on the tour? Yeah, he was a f even before I came on the tour. He he was uh, I felt like he was close. He was the first person to walk up to me in my first World Championship and kind of just be like, um, "I know who you are. We all know who you are. Great job, great achievement," um, and gave me a little bit of advice before I even played Andy Bolton. So it, ever since then, um, we've been pretty close. Yeah. That's the thing about darts. There are the people like Devin who. Welcome you in, and that's that's important to have when it can be quite a lonely sport at times. 
It, it really can be. But but to be honest, there hasn't been one player, whether you're MVG or Peter Wright or, or any any of the top players or the bottom players, no, you know, not in a negative way, but any of the 128 tour card holders, have, have, none of them have been rude to me. And it's been a, a welcoming sight, and it's been uh, just a, just an unbelievable experience, and I hope I can continue that. You're a massive sports fan in general, so to be a professional sportsman, you are living the dream right now, I suppose. The dream, yes. And how are you finding it so far? It's great. I, I just want I just want more of it. That's all I can do. You know, uh, first couple couple events where I wasn't playing bad, but uh, it just shows the caliber of the players. I just have to play better and, and get my timing better. That's it. Yeah. And you have no doubt that the results will come in time. One hundred percent.